feel that I, well, first of all, I want to greet you, but I feel that I should speak on a specific subject at the moment because of what we're seeing in the world. We're going through, as I speak to you, we're going through a very difficult time. Uh, we thought that vaccinations were the cure to, or the solution to COVID, but it seems that despite that, the numbers of uh, people that are getting COVID is going up in many countries. Um, it's presenting a lot of issues. At the same time, uh, as I speak, we're only uh, a short period after the collapse of Afghanistan and the American and, of course, the uh, NATO troops. And it's resulted in something basically unexpected in that even the Taliban themselves were not prepared for such a quick collapse. And therefore, as I speak to you, there's no stable government and there's utter chaos in a nation because when government disintegrates, uh, Western government, and um, when uh, a, a military group take over, which in effect you can almost think of a, a coup, a military coup, um, I can, that's the only thing I can describe it as. Um, there is no stability at any level. And um, add to that, of course, the questions of climate change. And we are facing at the moment a number of major crises. For that reason, I really do believe I've got to speak to you today on this subject concerning the return of Christ. Because for those of us who are born again, Bible-believing people, then we know that Christ is coming. We do accept that we are in the last days. Um, all the signs indicate that. Firstly, signs that I've already talked about and I'll be talking about in a moment. Also, the fact that Israel itself, um, the scripture teaches, as Jesus said, that um, Israel is a sign um, and it is the return of the Jews to their own nation in Israel that has been a major issue in the fulfillment of prophecy. And when you realize that for the second time, the Jews were, I mean, the first time, basically, they were thrown out to the time of the Babylonian Empire. But then, finally, uh, after the death of Christ, within a short time in AD 70, when the Romans finally threw out the Jews, destroyed the temple. And so it wasn't until 1945 that a real uh, present time state of Israel was established. I mean, I remember it. I can remember my father coming into my bedroom that morning in April uh, 1948 and saying, wonderful news, uh, there is a, a state of Israel. But of course, it was a state of war and uh, the, the nation was divided and it wasn't until 67 in the Six Day War. And by the way, I was actually in Israel when the war started because at the time I had the tour company, we were doing the overland tours and I had two groups, one on each side of the frontier when the war started. So I, I, I can tell you that was a pretty difficult time for me. But the point is that Israel has only been in existence in modern times, since biblical times, since 1948. And um, so Israel is in her infancy, but in so it is fulfilling biblical prophecy. Now, if we're going to look at the prophetic signs, I, I have to turn you to two different parts of the scripture. The first is in Luke 21. And I'm sure you're very familiar with this because Jesus is in the temple. 
he comments on the wealthy people giving and notes the widow who gives the mite, which was a very small coin. And uh, in verse 4, this is chapter 21, said all these of, of their abundance given, but she has given the offering out of her poverty. And in actual fact, Jesus said she's actually put in the offering all that she had. And so this caused quite a stir. But Jesus goes on and using this, as some were speaking in verse 5 of the temple and the lavishness of the temple, and there's no question. I mean, I think it's recorded that um, the building of the temple, they used 144 tons of gold. Now, it's, a, it's an incredible figure uh, when you realize the value of one ounce of gold. Uh, and when you compare it, I, I mean, it's just, it's beyond imagination, but that's how beautiful the temple was. But in verse uh, 6, he said, as for these things which you see, the days will come in which there will be not one stone left on another, not thrown down. And we know that was fulfilled in AD 70, with the overthrowing of the temple, when the uh, invaders, and I must call them that, absolutely robbed the temple of everything. I mean, there was so much gold and silver and brass and, and so on. They robbed the whole lot, destroyed the temple. And so in verse 7, they asked disciples, asked Jesus, say, Master, when shall these things be and what are the signs? that have to come to pass. And in verse 8, he says, Take heed that you're not deceived. Many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ. And the time draws near. Don't follow them. Verse 9, But when you will hear wars and commotions, don't be terrified. Now, I think the reason that I felt in my spirit that I had to speak on this today is because there's an enormous amount, enormous amount of fear at the moment over the collapse of Afghanistan. Because Afghanistan is now controlled by a violent, uh, very strict Islamic group who have a reputation for killing people, executing. And so they're threatening Christians and uh, women and uh, people that in any way connected with uh, the Western powers. Uh, I mean, the whole thing in Afghanistan at the moment is a nightmare. Probably by the time you actually hear my message, you, you'll see the fulfillment of that. But Jesus is simply saying of this, because that's not the only war. There's, there hasn't been a time of period, a period time of, in, in, of peace in the world since the end of the last war in 1945. And I mean, there are so many wars going on in Somalia, in Ethiopia. Uh, there's fighting in Iraq, in Libya, well, Syria. I, I, uh, the whole of, of, of that area has war, and Afghanistan, yes, of course, it's the major issue, but Jesus is saying you'll hear of wars and commotions, but don't be afraid, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet. So, when we see and hear these things, the real challenge of Jesus is look beyond it. And that's something that we as Christians have got to do. I mean, I've had to do it with my cancers, with my time in prison. You've got to look beyond because there is hope and glory beyond, as I shall show you in a moment. So then he said to them, verse 10, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then that, that we're seeing happening. And in verse 11, earthquakes, famines, 
plagues, fearful sights, and great signs from heaven. So, literally, the things that we're seeing with the floods, the fires, the earthquakes, the climate change were all clearly predicted in a short period by Jesus. And then he goes even further, because when you look at uh, verse 12, before even this, they shall lay their hands on you, persecute you, delivering up to synagogues, prisons, being brought before kings and rulers. And it shall become for you as a testimony. And the interesting thing is that I was even in a government meeting a few years ago when actually the government recognized Christians as being the most persecuted minority in the world. And there uh, uh, is a representation going on, I'm aware of, in Parliament at the moment for the government to restate this. Because looking at Afghanistan, we're hearing of the uh, hundreds of thousands, of tens, yes, but even hundreds of thousands of people who are trying to flee to escape from uh, terrorism and, and, and execution. And it's including women and it's including uh, people in government and so on. But even today, the real minority there are the Christians. And in Afghanistan, um, nobody is, is mentioning this. In fact, um, it was Lord Carey in, in the paper today that uh, is, is reminding us of the fact that Christians there are even more persecuted than anybody else because they're regarded as apostate. And uh, Carey, Lord Carey does quote the actual law under Sharia, which says that under a strict Islamic law, apostate men shall be killed and apostate women put in prison. And so, literally, these scriptures are being fulfilled. But he goes on and he says in verse 14, Now, when you are brought before magistrates and powers, just see in your own heart that you don't prepare the answer in advance. Because in verse 15, Jesus says, now these are the actual words of Jesus, he says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to resist. Wow. And you know, the amazing thing, I, I, I actually had to put this into practice because when I was accused before the court in uh, my trial, when I was in that communist prison, I was brought before a legal court. Uh, it's the only time my wife was actually allowed to be there to witness it. The British consul was there. And they made the accusations against me, but they had not allowed the accusations to be translated in advance so that I could in any way prepare. But the amazing thing is that as the charges were brought up, the Holy Spirit, in an incredible way, showed me how to answer. And when they said that I was guilty of bringing Bibles into the country, I was actually able to declare, firstly, that there was no tax due on them, and therefore were they going to condemn them, and secondly, that I had not actually crossed, legally crossed the border. I was at the border, and they then accused me of tax evasion on various things that I had, because I had relief for persecuted Christians. I'm talking about 1972. And I could say, and I said to the accuser, who was the, 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 the man, the officer on charge uh, of the situation, and who was my accuser at, from the border, and I said to him, but you did not give me the documents to sign to declare what was coming in. 
And the amazing thing was he had to confess before the court that he had failed. And so actually I wiped out two charges against me and I was only left with the content of the scripture, which they say the Bible attacks the state, and I was accused of sedition against the state. And when you look at scripture, you'll find that this is exactly the scripture that was brought against Jesus. It was exactly the same charge, and he couldn't deny it, and I can't deny it. So you see, all these are the things that are being fulfilled at the moment. And it even goes to say, in verse 16, you'll be betrayed by parents, by brothers, by your relatives, and some of you will be put to death, and you'll be hated of all men for my sake. But in verse 18, not one hair of your head will perish. Now that's significant because this is an eternal thing because we might be put to death, but no, we still will be preserved. And in verse 19, let patience possess your souls. In other words, we have to be patient and understanding. You know, it, it's not easy for me to speak to you and say, when you look at what's going on in the world with COVID, with uh, the various wars and all the other problems that we're facing, that the, Jesus actually said, when these happen, he says, firstly, don't be afraid. And secondly, he says, be patient. Why? What, what does patience mean? It means that you are calm in anticipation of the final solution. And if I were to speak about this, I, I suppose I would call the title of this message the final solution, because the final solution is the return of Christ, because it goes on in verse 20. When you shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, then know that the desolation is near. And then, of course, it means that they have to flee into the mountains in order that this, this might be fulfilled. And in verse 24, they will fall by the edge of the sword, led away captive. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then it goes on, signs in the sun, the moon, stars on earth, distress, perplexity, waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and looking after the things that are coming, for even the very powers of heaven shall be shaken. So literally, all the chaos, the panic, the uh, rebellion against climate change, and all these things were foretold clearly not just by prophets, but by Jesus himself. And he said men's hearts failing them for fear, because people are afraid. I mean, there's an element of fear after COVID. There is fear. But Jesus is quite clear, because he says, be patient, don't be afraid, because when all these things happen, then you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and great glory. And look up, because your redemption's coming. So the whole emphasis of what Jesus is saying was to compass the period from his death through AD 70 and the destruction of the temple, through all the centuries coming up till now. And now we can see how literally everything that Jesus was saying is being fulfilled. But he says, be patient, don't be afraid. All these things are an evidence of the end when Jesus comes back. So what he's trying to say is don't see this as destruction and terror and fear. Rejoice. And the strange thing is what he's really saying in what we're going through now, Christian, believe it. If you really believe the word of God, if you believe what Jesus is saying, you will not be afraid. And you know, 
there's something happened to me even when I was in the prison because at first, of course, I'm saying, Lord, why, why me and why this? But in the end, even in that prison, I had a sense of patience and, and no, I lost all my fear because I realized God was going to work a miracle and the miracle was my release with the British Prime Minister. Now, this isn't going to happen now. I tell you now, it's no British Prime Minister. Not even Boris Johnson can solve these problems, and certainly American presidents can't. But the fact is, Jesus is coming to resolve the issue. So, put it into context, Jesus is literally saying, when these things come to pass, then you know that it is the sign of the end of my return. And this is where in verse 29, he spoke the parable of the fig tree and said, you recognize the fig tree when it begins to get the leaves and the fruit come, then you know that summer is near. So, likewise, when all, verse 31, when you see all these things come to pass, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. And then it comes to a verse which, okay, takes some understanding. Verse 32, truly I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all is fulfilled. Now, it's, it certainly was not the generation of Jesus' time because this happened, he was talking 2,000 years ago. But I do believe that the generation which sees all these things that you're so afraid of, all these things that the world is so afraid of, this is the generation which will see the return of Christ. And the other interesting thing is going back to verse 24, where Jesus says, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles till the end of the time of the Gentiles. I believe we're coming to the end of the time of the Gentiles. That means we're coming to the end of the time of salvation for the Gentiles. And the scripture is very clear because it actually says, then all Israel will be saved. And this is why I believe God has called me uh, with a very strong, clear vision. And the strong vision I have is that we have to preach the gospel now as if every day is the last. Because I can tell you, and I will tell you in the next message, hopefully, the actual way in which Jesus is describing this and the prophets are describing it and, and, and the New Testament is describing it, how that there is going to come a time when the gospel is no longer preached to the Gentiles, the kingdom, the body of Christ is complete. And then Israel shall be saved. Now, this is why I work with such a sense of urgency, because I know and I believe, and in fact, I've believed all my life for more than 70 years. The time is short. It's almost as if in those days when I had to leave school and work to get the money to go to Bible college and, and I was so agitated saying I don't have time to go to the college. Jesus is coming. We've got to preach the gospel. It's almost as if to me that was a prophetic experience that propelled me into the urgency and I have that sense of urgency. I have it now and coming out of COVID and coming out of these restrictions, uh, I have an even greater sense of urgency to preach the gospel, to bring our loved ones into the kingdom now. Because in that sense, there is no tomorrow, because tomorrow Christ comes. And if I go into Thessalonians, as I will do in the next message, hopefully, in Thessalonians, it does quite clearly say that Jesus comes back as a thief in the night and nobody knows when he's coming. It's sudden, it's unexpected. There is no time. I mean, it actually says two in a bed, two in a field, two in a workplace. One is taken and the other's left. That's the suddenness of the return of Christ. And I want to say, 
Yes, and that's why there's an urgency to preach the gospel to the Jews. And that's why my heart is so strong at the moment. And I believe that it was all those years ago, more than 70 years, in actual fact, 75 years ago, when God put such a spirit in me that I was saying, Oh God, wait for me. I'm coming. Don't give my job to somebody else. And God hasn't given my job to anybody else. I've got to do it, and I've got to go on doing it until Jesus comes. Now, we need to really think seriously of these issues, but I am saying be comforted, be patient, and have no fear, because whatever you're seeing that's making the world afraid is only the indication the return of Christ is nearer than you can even think. God bless you. Now, I want to urge you to, to buy the books that I'm writing because it's one of the miracles of the lockdown that I've taken the chance that I never had time to do before, and I'm writing books, but these books are getting more and more powerful. And the strange thing is that God is revealing so much that I never understood before. And look, it's I've got 70 years of ministry packed into my life. Now I need it to explode and I want to pass it on to you what God is showing me. Look, you'll find the books on the website and just send to us and God bless you. This is Prophetic Vision. It's the most powerful prophetic magazine in Europe today. It's read by almost half a million people in 132 countries around the world. Send for it free and let God show you the path to revival in your life, in your nation. Well, I've just been speaking uh, in, in a program that will go out on vision and the need of the world and the need of evangelism. And I can tell you this, I have an enormous vision today of what God needs to do. I mean, we need Jesus now. The whole nation needs Jesus. The whole world needs Jesus. And there are so many other false religions coming, but we can't do it without your support. We need the finance. Look, people say, why do you have to pay so much for crusades? And I, one of my answers is this. You can't ask the sinner to pay for his salvation. And we make a principle of never taking up an offering in an evangelistic meeting for fear of criticism from the world that we're only there for the money. It's better to give than to receive. And I'm asking you for your support in Jesus' name.